Habakkuk chapter number three in your Bibles this morning. Habakkuk 3 is a prayer. A prayer, verse 1 says, of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shagianoth. This is not the first uh, record of Habakkuk praying, but it is a remarkably distinctly different kind of prayer than the first prayer that we studied in chapter number one. And uh, Habakkuk, as is always true when we pray sincerely, when we pray honestly, reveals the condition of his heart as he prays. You see, in many ways, folks, prayer is a stethoscope of the condition of our spiritual heart. How we pray indicates how we feel, how we think. And in Habakkuk chapter number one, Habakkuk was very angry. Not just at people who were making his life miserable, unfairly, but angry at God who was allowing this. His prayer in chapter number 1, verse 2 says, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? He was very upset with God. Something amazing has taken place, however. Now when we see him pray, he says, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. What a different tenor. What a different attitude. Is it not true that how we pray and what we pray for is an indication of the spiritual condition of our heart? It's how we think and how we feel. Little Johnny, and I hesitate, I hate, you know, if you've got the name Johnny, I feel sorry for you, sir, because Johnny seems to be the Mr. Smith of all jokes, you know? And uh, but little Johnny was getting ready to go to bed one night, and he's kneeling by his bed. His mom, his mother is nearby, and so is his grandmother. And he's praying, uh, whispering a prayer on his knees to the Lord. Oh, Lord, little Johnny prayed, please bless mommy, please bless daddy. Please watch over my brothers and sisters, our family, as we sleep tonight. Amen. Oh, he said, by the way, and don't forget my new bicycle for my birthday. He shouted. Mother said, oh, Johnny, you needn't yell. God is not deaf. He said, yeah, I know, but Granny is. <laughs> <laughs> well, prayer is a revelation of how we feel and how we think. In fact, in contrasting this prayer that we're going to begin to study this morning, in chapter 3 and chapter number, contrasting it with chapter number 1, uh, it reminded me of the, the meaning of Habakkuk's name. We haven't discussed this yet. Habakkuk's name is, is it's, there are two different, it's, it's the same word, but it has two different applications. Number one, Habakkuk's name means to wrestle. But Habakkuk's name also means to embrace. Now, if you're wrestling someone, it could be said you're embracing them. And if you're embracing them, you're wrestling them. But wrestling and embracing are not the same. The attitude when someone wrestles is you've got something that I want or you're doing something I don't like or... It is punitive, it is punishment, it is, it is uh, the, you're spilling out of our feelings or our anger inside. And you could say, you know, we're wrestling. You know, Jacob wrestled with the, angel, with the angel of the Lord. He Habakkuk with the angel of the Lord. He wrestled with him. Wanted something and was not, you know. Now embracing is an affection. 
It's a saying, I'm not wrestling with you. I'm not fighting you. I'm yielding to you. Now, that's Habakkuk's name. Wrestle or embrace. Now, can you see the comparison in his first prayer? Is he not wrestling with God? He's upset. He's angry. And God's response? (laughs) You think it's bad now. It's just going to get worse. And he is, in a sense, he's, he's livid about this. His focus is on his circumstances. Now you see him in chapter number three and Habakkuk's praying. He's not wrestling with God. He's embracing God. He's saying, oh, you're so incredible. You know the word fear here? The word fear is, it's to be overwhelmed with awe. Now he was overwhelmed in chapter number one with his circumstances, with the injustice of it all. Why am I having to go through this? Because after all, I have lived for you. I've done the right thing. Nothing will raise our our anger temper more rapidly than an injustice. I mean, you just cut me off. You just don't treat me fairly. You let somebody else get something and we're on the same, you know, we're on the same level and they get something that I don't receive. I want to tell you, that'll make me mad faster than just about anything else. And Habakkuk is no different than you and I. 2,600 years haven't changed human nature at all. The fact that he was a preacher, a prophet of God, he's scratching his head saying, why in the world are these things happening to me and to my friends here? And we've been the faithful few, and yet now things are going to really fall apart. But Habakkuk has changed. And that's the subject this morning. I'm going to talk to you this morning about this subject. Faith changes how we pray. Faith changes how we pray. The circumstances are no different in chapter number 3, but his attitude is different. What happened between Habakkuk in chapter number 1 and Habakkuk in chapter number 3? The exhortation from the Lord, that's our subject, that's why we're here after all in Habakkuk. Life isn't what? DIY. Life is not do-it-yourself. The just, the Bible declares four times, shall live by faith. And that word from God was believed by Habakkuk. And that faith then changed his attitude. It did not change his circumstances one iota, but it changed the prophet's attitude. Prayer in our minds oftentimes is associated with simply in our mind it's almost like a, a, a genie in a bottle. We want to rub the bottle just right and Jesus is going to come out and say, okay, you're praying, what do you want? And I'll do it. Now there is a dimension of prayer that, that supports that. But prayer is not so much to change God and our circumstances as it is to change our attitude. Prayer is a revelation of the attitude of our heart. Listen to someone pray, and you can tell the absence or the presence of faith. Faith in God transforms the way we pray. And the renewing of hope and confidence and praise in the heart of Habakkuk is God's desire and plan and design for every one of us in this room this morning. And I cannot, on the basis of God's word, I cannot promise to you that your circumstances are going to get any better anytime soon. The fact of the matter is, Habakkuk lived and died under dire circumstances. He never lived to see the children of Israel emancipated, returning back to their land. But it happened. And so it is that God may allow our situation to not only be difficult, but humanly intolerable. And we may pray and pray and pray, but somewhere along the line, God says, I want to change your attitude. I want you to learn to be content with this situation, even if it never gets any better during your lifetime. And the only way you can change your attitude 
is to live by faith in me. That's what God is saying. Depending upon the Lord will transform the way we pray. Number one, Habakkuk prayed differently, although his circumstances had not improved. The Bible says here that this is a prayer, verse number one of Habakkuk, the prophet, upon Shagianoth. Now that's not a word I've used very often. Probably you haven't either. In fact, it's only found one other time in the Bible, and that it would be in the seventh psalm. It's a word that means a time of wandering. Now here's what he's saying. It's saying in God's word, the wandering is continuing. Now, the wandering is a word that is associated with the children of Israel and their 40 years of what we would consider to be in many ways wasted energy and effort wandering in a wilderness because of their lack of faith to follow the will of God. But it is also descriptive of that time in our lives when we're living apart from the center of God's will and the blessings that come with being in the middle of God's will. And so it was in his, not his personal life, but in, his, in, the, in the life of the country that Habakkuk lived in in that time, Israel, they were wandering from God. And that wandering was, uh, resulted then in this, this extreme and difficult, painful uh, discipline that came to them from the Lord. And God's hand of discipline upon the children of Israel extended even to those who were innocent of personal guilt in wandering from the Lord. So then we have a, a statement here. He's saying, God's telling us, we, he wants you to know and emphasize for you that the circumstances have not changed. They're just as bad as they were in chapter number one. But you're going to be absolutely amazed at the attitude change in the prophet of God. Now, wouldn't that be good if that would be said, it could be said of you and me? The only way it's going to happen is if you and I are willing to live by faith in God. Do you know God's word must be more than just right here? Coming to hear God's word is designed to change the way we think. When we change the way we think, we change the way we live. We change the way we feel. And it changes then the way we pray. Now then, the, the focus of Habakkuk, sure, those things are still going on, but now his focus is on the Lord and on the goodness and the greatness and the mercy of God and how desperately he needs it. That's the kind of change I'm talking about, and that's what God wants to do in your life and mine. The only way, it's not going to come through a pep talk. It's not going to come through a turning over a new leaf. It's not going to come because you try harder. The only means of changing the way we pray, the way we think, the way we feel, our attitude is by faith in God's word. So here we go. Seeing Habakkuk make a change, he prayed differently, though his circumstances had not improved. He, wandering was at the core of Israel's life, and God's wrath was inevitable and, and, and almost intolerable, humanly speaking, but Habakkuk had found home in his heart. Uh, home in his heart with his relationship with God. Number two, Habakkuk prayed in response to hearing and believing God's word. He says in our passage here, verse, one, verse 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. Now the word speech there is God's word being spoken. That's what happened in chapter number 1, and that's what happened in chapter number 2. God did respond at first with a very, very difficult uh, to receive statement that the Chaldeans were going to come and were going to destroy the land, carry the children of Israel into captivity. But then in chapter number 2, God reveals through his word the damage and danger and destructive nature of pride and how imperative it is that Habakkuk and others place their confidence, their faith in the Lord, knowing with confidence that God will, in the end, God will make all things right and that it will go well with Habakkuk in eternity future. And as a result of that, 
Habakkuk begins to pray differently. You know, God's, God's word must be listened to, and that's what we're doing right now. But God's word also must be believed. If you and I, have you, have you heard someone, and maybe you've even said this, you said, you know, I don't know why I go to church. I go and I listen to the sermons and things never change. Maybe you're thinking, you're wanting things to change out here, where God's thinking is that he's wanting to change things in here. And you say, well, yeah, but I know. I mean, I know all these things. Okay, but do you believe them? You say, oh, sure I do. Are you sure that you're sure? Why? Because what you really believe is demonstrated by what you, what you say and how you live. And particularly, we're talking this morning about how you pray. You know, if I was to listen to you pray, I couldn't tell the measure of your faith. And if you're praying like Habakkuk chapter number one, you need a big dose of confidence and trust and dependence upon the Lord. And that's why you need to get into the Bible and let the Bible get into you so that we can change the way we think and change the way then that we pray. You know, the unsaved believer says, why pray? But the unbelieving believer also says, why pray? I know that's an oxymoron, an unbelieving believer, but it's true. We can have faith to believe in Christ for salvation, and then it stops. We say, all right, I, I, I'm really confident. I don't worry about it. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. Yes, I know, because I received Christ as my personal Savior. I, on, and, on and on. But is that all you have of faith? Is that the only extent of your belief? If that's true of you, then you're a complaining worry wart too. But our faith must grow beyond that. Boy, I'll just tell you, just even saying those things, I am under such conviction because this is, a, this is a battle in my own personal life. And I know if the pastor faces it, you know, periodically, circumstances, I'll be talking more about it tonight, circumstances happen in, the, in our corporate life, in our personal lives, and you think, oh my goodness, how are we ever going to get out of this and, and survive? Or, you know, how are we going to live? And on and on it goes. And the devil messes with your mind. I'll tell you what, we've got to, we've, we've got to get to chapter number two and get that faith in God and in his word. And then God will change the way we feel and the way we think and the way we pray. Habakkuk did that. He, he, he received God's word, believed God's word, and it changed the way he prayed. Number three, Habakkuk uh, prayed with fear. He prayed with fear. He says in our text here this morning, verse number two, he says, I have uh, heard thy speech and was afraid. Does God's word make you yawn? Well, then you're not responding properly to it. You and I need to, need to be moved by the word of God. He said, I heard what you said, God. Not I, just, not I heard what the preacher said. Now, you're hearing what the preacher says. I think you are. But are you hearing what God says? And is God not speaking to you? Is he not making application in your life? Oh, he has to me, and he is to me, even while I'm talking to you. And it's important to listen to the voice of the Lord and to respond properly. Fear is an emotion. Uh, there are people that pride themselves with their stoicism. They're in such control of their emotions. No, it might not be because you're in such control of your emotions, sir or ma'am. It may be because your heart's hard. It may be because you're so stubborn that you're not willing to listen to God. You see, we say, well, I, you know, I'm just not the crying type. Well, maybe you should become a little more the crying type. Do you, do you, no, I found this out. You know, most good things in life, you had to feel bad before you felt good. Have you ever noticed that? I, I, there's one man I do not like. His name's Dave Johnson. I don't like Dave Johnson. He's a doctor. He's my dentist. <laughs> Every time I go there, he puts me in pain and then charges me for it. It's like, this is sadistic. All right, but you get the picture, though? You say, I'm not going to go to the dentist. 
Yeah, well, you're going to continue hurting. Yeah, but it'll hurt me more. Yeah, but after he hurts you, then it'll get better. At least it's supposed to. <laughs> but Habakkuk prayed, and he was afraid. You know, this is evidence of a man who's spiritually sensitive. You know, direct or indirect revelation from God through his word ought to lead us to fear, and it ought to lead us to pray. You know, the word here is overwhelmed. But no longer is he overwhelmed by circumstances as in chapter number one. Now he's overwhelmed by God. Let me read. I, I just was so good and I just didn't want to steal it. I'm going to read. It's about a paragraph and, along and it's Warren Wearsby. And it's right on this thought that we're talking about. Wearsby says, quote, Many people have the idea that it's always an enjoyable experience getting to know God in a deeper way. But that's not what the saints of God in the Bible would say. Moses trembled on Mount Sinai when God spoke to him and gave him the law. When Joshua heard from God, he fell on his face. Joshua 5. David did likewise, 1 Chronicles 21, 16. When Daniel heard from God, he was exhausted and ill. Daniel 8 and Daniel 10. Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration when they heard from God and saw God's glory, Christ's glory, they fell down on the ground and they were filled with terror. Matthew 17, 6. And when John saw the glorified Christ, he fell at his feet as though dead. Revelation 1, 17. Wearsby goes on to say, A.W. Tozer said, To know God is at once the easiest and most difficult thing in the world. You see, God has the ability to reveal himself to us. He can do anything. The problem is finding someone who is ready to meet him. God does not reveal himself to superficial saints, Wearsby writes, who are only looking for a new experience that they can brag about, or to curious Christians who simply want to sample deeper fellowship with God, but not at too great a price. End of quote. Here's, here it is. When we know by God's word that our situation is going to continue to be painful, it's going to continue to be unfair for an unspecified period of time, there's only one recourse for us. We must respond by faith in God and in his word. If we gain that faith in God through his word, it will lead us to think differently, feel differently, and it will then change the way we pray. Number four, Habakkuk with this change, prayed intercedingly. You know, his praying was focused on three different issues here in chapter number three. And this is totally different than you find him praying in chapter number one. It's chapter number one, you know, I've got this problem, get rid of it. I've got this problem, get rid of it. I've got this other problem, get rid of it. I do not want to live my life this way and it's not fair that I do. Now in chapter number three, notice what he says. Revive thy work. Number one, in the midst of the years. By the way, in the midst of the years simply means, no! <laughs> That's what he's saying. <laughs> he's saying, please, revive thy work. You know, in chapter number one, it's all, it's all on, it's my, it's me. Chapter number three, now he's concerned about God and God's work. And you know what God's work is? God's work is people. You know what God was... It, the word revive means bring it back to life. And none of us can live. It, the Christian life is never going to be lived without valleys. It, 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 then there is a mountain, and then there's a valley, and then there's a mountain, and there's all that time, most of the time is spent in between. You're either going up or going down. You're either going up in a mountain, a mountain or you're coming down into a valley, and you don't know what's around the bend. We don't even know what the next moment will hold. But we do know that this is the way our lives will be. So then, we must find, when we find ourselves in places where we're in the valleys, we need to say, oh Lord, please send revival into my life. Otherwise, if someone just lived on the mountain, what would it be? It'd be vival. It'd be a, but that's not the way life is. It's like a, a coming to life again. And this is what became the burden of the prophet of God. And uh, when God revives his work in our hearts, then it may not change our circumstances, but most importantly, it'll do what God's really concerned about. God's word tells us that his work is 
about changing us. You know, ultimately, he wants you and me to become just like Jesus Christ. And so Habakkuk lived his life. He died. It was always painful, always difficult. But his attitude was different because of the presence of faith in God in his life. Oh, I mentioned he prayed for three things here. Notice the second and the third in conclusion. Uh, he said, in, in the midst of the years, make known. Make known. Uh, make known what? The context here, it, it, he's saying, make yourself known. Can you, uh, can you see the evidence of, of, uh, of humility in this man now? You know, when your focus changes to God's work and instead of your own problems, or it changes to this matter of God being known. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a phrase asking God you know, to reveal himself to the world. He's saying, you know, if everybody could see you like I see you in verse number three here, he talks about the earth, the heaven and the earth full of his praise. He said, boy, if everybody could see you, that changed the way they'd think, that changed the way they'd live. And you know, that's true. It's really not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. And when we, when we gain faith in the Lord, it changes the way we pray. We begin to pray then for God to breathe life into his work. We pray for God to make himself known in our world. And number three, and lastly, he said, and in wrath, remember mercy. You know, he said, all right, I accept the fact that, you know, I'm going to have to endure these things. That's the wrath. But he said, please, in that wrath, would you, re would you remember mercy? Mercy, when, you, when someone asks for mercy, it is a bona fide testimony of the right attitude of their heart. You know, if somebody says, give me what I deserve, they think they deserve better than what they're receiving, don't they? But when someone says, oh, please, don't give me what I deserve. Please give me your mercy. That's a person whose life has been changed by faith in God's word. And so it is that God wants to bring you and me through these circumstances from chapter 1 praying to chapter 3 praying. And he may not ever give relief from that pain that you're suffering today. That issue, that person, that problem may never go away in this lifetime. But that doesn't mean that you have to be miserable. Your life can be better. Your praying can be better, but only through faith in God. The just shall live by his faith.